Hi, friend. Welcome to this six-session Bible study of my book, I Want to Trust You, But I Don't. Of all the topics I've written about, trust has been one of the most challenging. Part of the reason is because distrust is sometimes the most responsible and appropriate choice to make. If someone gives us reasons that trusting them would lead to hurt and hardship, then of course we should be cautious. But we also must be careful to not get into a place where we are so averse to the risk of relationships that we don't wanna trust anyone. The topic of trust is one that is so deeply personal to me, especially during these past two years that I took to research and write on all of this. Maybe you know that I've experienced so many unexpected twists and turns that just kept coming. The ironic part of my ever-changing life is that I like consistency. I like the feeling of getting to a good place and keeping it good. And yet, the way my life has played out has been anything but predictable. But there's been a beautiful new chapter in my story. And for those of you who follow me on social media, you know this, but in case you don't know, after remaining single for several years, God brought an amazing man named Chaz into my life. So when you hear me mention him in the study, you'll be all caught up on where I am now. Learning to trust again in my new marriage and honestly in all of my relationships has not been an easy journey for me. My heart had been shattered. My confidence in my own discernment had been severely shaken. And even my trust in God was affected as I wrestled through what He allowed. I would imagine that you've probably felt some of these same harsh realities in relationships and situations that you've walked through. So what do we do about it? Are there biblical answers? How do I know who to turn to? And can anyone really be trusted? Is it possible to repair broken trust? And what about those times when distrust is actually the wisest choice to make? And what do I do with some of the deep questions about a good God who sometimes allows really bad things to happen? Well, we're gonna get to all of this and more during our time together. But before we dive into talking about trust, I wanna point out something a little crazy I've noticed about us humans. We are sometimes more prone to trust strangers than we are the people we know. I mean, we trust strangers to fly us in metal tubes called airplanes. We get in strangers' cars and allow them to take us places just because we found them on a ride for hire app. We trust strangers to make us food at restaurants and kitchens we don't see using ingredients we are, for the most part, oblivious to. Unless we make them aware of an allergy, we don't know the recipes they're using. We trust influencers we've never met to inform us of products we should buy. We trust bankers that we really don't know with our money and surgeons we only have spent a little bit of time with to take our lives in their hands. We don't give much thought to whether we can trust these people or not until we have a negative experience or we're given a reason not to trust. A negative experience makes us pause and doubt, but as these continue to happen, the hesitations to trust are just reinforced over and over until we can no longer trust this person or situation at all. When one of my daughters was younger, she loved having sleepovers with her very close friends, and she would go over to their houses and have a lot of fun until she started having a string of negative experiences. So from that, she created a sleepover checklist, and she wanted me to call the other mother before she went and discuss this list, y'all. Being a mom is hard, and I still laugh about this to this day. It was so awkward for me to call and have the checklist conversation, but her list wasn't just full of imagined concerns. These things had happened to her before. First on the list, no big dogs. Well, a big dog had jumped on her before and scratched her. Next, she had to sleep six to nine inches off the floor. And that was because she'd been at a friend's house where she slept on the floor and woke up with painful ant bites all over. And then there was the absolutely no spaghetti for dinner 
because she'd gotten sick from it at a sleepover and was now sick of it. There was a reason she had this list. And as silly as this example is, I want to clearly state that instead of shaming ourselves for trust issues or feeling like we're being ridiculous, we want to recognize that our trust issues have roots in reality. Throughout this study, I want to care tenderly for your heart. So we will be focusing on what to do when others have broken trust with you. And at the same time, I want to acknowledge that none of us get this right all of the time. And the lessons we can learn can also be good reminders to us of how we want to be the kind of people others can trust. We're going to explore three crucial aspects when we've had our trust broken that have led us to wrestling with trust issues. First, our skepticism of others when we don't really know who we can trust. Second, trusting God, when we're tempted to blame Him for allowing things that we just don't understand. And third, when we have been completely caught off guard by another person's deceptions, we can start to doubt our own discernment. Trust issues happen horizontally within human-to-human relationships, vertically when we're confused by what God allowed, and it makes us so fearful of our future. And internally, when we aren't sure if what we're feeling is discernment or really triggers from past pain. That's why I'm excited about this study, where we will identify which of the 11 relational red flags are stirring up distrust, so you're able to better pinpoint why you're feeling so uneasy. We're also gonna recognize when it's possible to repair a fractured relationship and how to do it with a five-step framework that you can start using today. We're also gonna better understand what the Bible says about trusting God and others so you're equipped to make decisions that are in line with Scripture. And we're gonna learn how to know the difference between a feeling you're having and true discernment from the Holy Spirit so you can move on from the past with more wisdom and assurance. Whew, this is gonna be good and hard and healing and all the things. So let's make a promise to each other as I'm vulnerable about my hurt and you are with yours. We will let truth and grace both stay present as we explore this topic of trust. Grace will hold our hearts as truth guides our thoughts. Last week, I literally sat at my kitchen table with a friend and said, is this world just full of unkind people? Is everyone eventually gonna turn on everyone? Can I really trust anyone? I was fresh off of another situation where I trusted someone who then made some decisions that were so very confusing and honestly, really hurtful. All this person had to do was come to me and tell the truth. Instead, I found out through social media and just sat stunned by the whole situation. But I'm not unique with this. When I say the words broken trust, most of us have stories that pop into our head and a twinge of hurt that courses through our heart. When I set out to write my books and Bible studies, I write about the things I struggle with. And I can absolutely admit, trust is something I've wrestled with for years. As a matter of fact, when I wrote my last book in Bible study, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, there was a sentence in that message that planted the seed for this one. Trust is the oxygen of all human relationships. As I think about that sentence right now, I nod my head in agreement, but I also sigh because of how hard trust can be. In my journey, I've gone from being too trusting of too many people to feeling skeptical and wanting to withdraw from all people. Now, I'm trying to find the right balance and trust the right people in the right ways. I don't wanna be naive, but I also don't wanna be avoidant. Surely, there has to be a better way to look at trust through the lens of wisdom rather than through the shattered experiences from when people have hurt us. That's why I decided to tackle this topic. I was struggling to trust people. I was wrestling with some deep questions about trusting God, 
And I was so doubtful of my own discernment, since I'd obviously missed some things and had my heart broken in really hard ways. If you can relate to this, welcome to being human. I've yet to meet another human who has escaped the pitfalls of thinking they can count on someone, but then that someone really let them down. Even small issues of broken trust can have a big impact on our heart. That's why in this first session, I wanna talk about the requirements of trust. To have trust, there must be two crucial factors. First, safety, and the other, connection. We'll dig into safety in just a minute, but let's start with the connection part of trust. Connection is the reason we're drawn to someone with the hope that the feelings will be mutual and that the treatment will be honoring of the care and compassion you both deserve. In other words, there will be mutual love present. But sin in the world has tainted God's intention for connection and love. You know, in the dating scene where hookups have become the norm, there's such an emphasis on physical connection. We've lost this understanding that sex and intimacy are not always one and the same. You get deeply connected to someone when you have a physical relationship with them, and this can provide a false sense of intimacy and safety because God's original intent was always for this kind of connection to be made in the context of marriage that's built on mutual trust. Casual sexual hookups may give a feeling of intimacy in the moment, but emotionally and physically, it can lead to hurt and heartbreak and set the stage for broken trust from the very beginning. Part of how trust is built in a relationship is when the connection is safe for both people. But when God's design of connection and love is short-circuited, trust can very easily be at risk. This isn't true just with romantic relationships, but with other types of connection as well. Within friendships, we must guard against a false sense of intimacy through social media and trading face-to-face -face time with just observing one another's lives. Social media connections aren't bad per se, but if we have social media connections just for self-serving purposes, this is where trust can erode. People sniff out when the motivation for connection is inauthentic or comes with a catch. Remember, trust requires connection, but it also requires safety. Sometimes we want connection so badly that we overlook red flags that are warning us that we might not be safe. Other times, we're so hyper-focused on self-protecting and avoiding the risk of getting hurt that we don't allow for any depth in our connections. We wanna bring connection and safety into balance so trust can be achieved. Okay, now that we've looked at the importance of connection, let's dig a little deeper into safety. Safety must be present in three arenas, physical, emotional, and spiritual. A compromise of any of these three arenas is a threat to the holistic peace God wants for us. If safety is compromised, this is how it can play out. First of all, physically. For me, I won't feel safe enough to trust someone if they are dismissive over my concerns or if there's a lack of protection. In one of my relationships, part of the reason I really struggled to trust was because this person, every time I expressed concerns about my safety, they always just blew me off with statements like, you're always being so cautious. You take all of the fun out of everything we do. You'll be fine. They constantly minimized what I could clearly see as justifiably concerning. And of course, a lack of physical safety can also happen if we're experiencing physical harm in any way. Second is emotionally. Sometimes a lack of physical safety can also involve emotional abuse. Threatening, yelling, or intentionally making someone afraid or belittling them can cause serious trauma. Betrayals are also a serious form of not feeling safe emotionally. I found some interesting information from one research psychologist who said, the most common forms of betrayal are harmful disclosures of confidential information, disloyalty, infidelity, and dishonesty. 
We can't underestimate how much trust is eroded when there's deception, emotional manipulation, betrayal, or when you share something with someone that you shared in private, but then they start using it against you, or gaslighting, shifting blame, playing mind games. Ugh, that's a lot of hard stuff. But it just goes to show how much trust can be damaged when there are these kinds of toxic and harmful traits in relationships. And I don't want to use the word toxic lightly. These really can kill trust and destroy relationships. Third is spiritually. This is when scripture is used as a weapon or manipulation tactic to gain control, keep power over someone, or disregard the other person's personal dignity and value as a son or daughter of God. Ultimately, this is when Scripture is used to move a personal agenda forward while completely disregarding the heart of God. Let's look at Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 in the CSB version. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learned. Avoid them, because such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. When these types of behaviors exist, we have to be honest with ourselves that the breaches of safety in the relationship won't allow for the kind of trust that healthy relationships are built on. That's why it's so important to ask these questions before trusting this person. Am I safe with this person physically? Am I safe with this person emotionally? Am I safe with this person spiritually? As you ask these questions, take this opportunity to truly assess what you have been and are experiencing in this relationship. Now, I just wanna stop here and say one thing. Authentic relationships require vulnerability and quite honestly, risk. We're never going to be able to strip all the relational risk out of every situation. It will always be present, but we can use wisdom in assessing what is reasonable and what is acceptable risk. With this in mind, we must also accept that no human relationship will have perfect trust. There's an interesting detail about the Hebrew word bata that's often translated into our English Bibles as trustworthy. In the Bible, when the object of trust is Yahweh, God, there's always a positive context to it. Our circumstances may feel risky, and our understanding of what's happening to us may feel risky, but the character of God contains no risk. He's always trustworthy. However, when the object of trust is humanity, other humans, the majority of the time when the word bata is used, it has a negative context. So what does this mean? The Bible frames the concept of trust in such a way that we should always be reminded that God is the only one who is truly trustworthy. But while we can't expect perfect trust with other humans, we can build trust within the context of connection and safety. That's why even if we don't understand God's parameters of love, He sets these from His trustworthy nature. In relationships where it feels challenging to love the way the Bible tells us to love, we must know this is coming from the one who knows how love and trust should work together. You can't truly love someone according to God's design if you're compromising biblical truth, and you can't truly trust someone without the presence of safety and connection. When we think about love, sometimes we reduce it down to a cultural view that focuses on what feels good to me. The emphasis is on me, what I want, desire, and what serves me best. We have to get back to what God really desires for relationships that are set up for trust, safety, and connection by assessing how we love one another. And if we wanna see how safety and connection play out in a healthy way, It's this, seeking each other's highest good. Now, if you're taking notes, make sure to highlight this phrase, seeking each other's highest good. That's biblical love and what fosters trust. 1 John 4, 7 in the Amplified Version says this, Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best 
from one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. This same verse in the NIV says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, hang with me for just a minute through some theological fun work. John tells us to love one another, but something really important here is the English phrase, one another. It actually comes from a Greek reciprocal pronoun, alalos. The focus of the love is actually reciprocity. In other words, it's a type of love that bounces back and forth with equal weight and value between two people. So reciprocity is actually what makes this love work. The moment one party refuses to respond to that love that they've received, the reciprocal nature of this one another type of love is broken. When love turns from being focused on seeking the other person's highest good to becoming selfish and self-seeking, this is where safety and connection start to get compromised and trust will soon erode. Love should be unselfish. Unselfish love is the safest kind of connection that makes trust so much less risky in human relationships. Now, if we continue on through 1 John 4 and get into verses 10 through 11, here's what it says. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There's an important detail here. We have a command to love one another, but we have to be careful that we don't see this command to love as a demand to trust no matter what. Trust in human relationships requires evidence of trustworthiness. Void of this evidence, it's not only appropriate, but it's actually wise to have a posture of caution and to guard our hearts against untrustworthy people. Trust is earned, not unconditionally given. If someone demands that you trust them with their words, but violates their trustworthiness with their actions, they're actually the ones to be most cautious of. Remember, in order for trust to be present, the requirements of trust must be established, accepted, and lived out. We must resist trying to get the benefits of trust without requiring the essential elements of trust in some of our relationships. Have you ever seen one of those Instagram posts that says, how is it that I only learned this when I was today years old? That's how I feel about some of what we're discussing with trust. There's so much I didn't know for years as I tried to navigate trust with angst and confusion. I really wish I would have had all this wisdom and insight sooner, but I'm gonna trust that I need it now so that I can make wise choices moving forward. After all, my counselor, Jim Kress, he always likes to remind me, when you know better, you do better. Well, I pray that after all we've learned today, we'll be better equipped to understand the requirements of safety and connection leading to trust so we can enjoy the benefits of trust in healthy and honoring ways.